All right, this is the College of Complexes, and uh, we, we begin with Ramsey Steele, who has spoken here many times before, and you have uh, been uh, apprised uh, of his scholarliness, and uh, he will be speaking tonight on good and bad in Karl Popper. Uh, Karl Ryman Popper uh, was a philosopher, uh, Austrian uh, by birth, uh, okay. uh, knighted uh, by uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, in 1667, I think it was. Okay. And uh, he was anti Marx, or at least uh, Marxist historicity, whatever. Let's uh, welcome David right. Ramsey Steele. David Ramsey Steele. Yeah, boy. Well, good evening, uh, fellow members of the human species and anybody else who may be paying attention. I only just made it tonight. Uh, I remember, I've only been here once before, and I remember I took a train to Addison, and it was a very short walk, so I thought I'd do the same. So I took a train to Addison. I didn't realize there were several Addison stations. And when I came out of the station, there was Wrigley Field. I thought, I, I, I'm sure I would have remembered that. So anyway, I've just had a brisk walk up from Wrigley Field, so oh, I feel really? like a snooze now. Uh, but you can all snooze because I'm going to talk about philosophy, um, which is um, a good occasion, a good soporific. Um, so, um, so Karl Popper, good and bad in Karl Popper. Um, Karl Popper was born in Vienna, Austria, in 1902. So that means that his teens, his early teens, there was the First World War, there was the end of the Austrian Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, there was the Bolshevik Revolution, and there was the expectation all across Europe, especially Central Europe, that there would be revolutionary uprisings. And he was, a, <coughs> he came from a, <coughs> a comfortably off uh, assimilated Jewish family. Um, and he was quite precocious, interested in ideas from a very, very early age. Uh, and the ideas that were buzzing about in Vienna when he was a teenager included Marxism, uh, Freudianism, or psychoanalysis, uh, Adler, Adlerism, or individual psychology, um, and Einstein's relativity, which was still comparatively new. Um, which was highly controversial, uh, and also Schoenberg's new music. Um, so um, uh, Popper was very much involved with uh, that new music. He didn't like the new music, but he was very knowledgeable about music, and he was involved in the... He attended the very first performance of Piero Lunaire, which those of you who know Schoenberg know what that is. Um, uh, and music had a big impact on him, but I'm not going to say much about that because it would take me too far afield. So, um, <clears throat> so he was very interested in Marxism. He was a Marxist. He became a Marxist as a child uh, and remained a Marxist until he was about 16 or 17. Um, and of course, the, the big Marxist party was the Social Democratic Party. Uh, the Communist Party would only have been formed in 1919, like communist parties all over the world, they were all formed in 1919 or 1920, um, when the Bolsheviks decided that there should be separate uh, parties to represent their revolutionary uh, approach and uh, to attack all the other socialist groups that existed. Um, he had a big emotional experience when he was uh, uh, in 1919, so that's when he was 17 years old. He was involved in a demonstration in which the police uh, actually killed a number of the demonstrators. Um, uh, it, was, it was a left-wing demonstration. Uh, now, you might expect that this would make him even more hostile to the ruling class and more of a militant revolutionary. Um, and no doubt he did that for many people. But what it did for him was it made him think. Uh, and he was talking to a lot of communists who were telling him that... Uh, this is just what we should expect, and they were somewhat smacking their lips over the fact that actual violence had occurred and people had been killed, because this was 
uh, part of the painful re rebirth, a painful birth of the new society, the revolutionary new society. So he started thinking, well, um, I'm a Marxist, but do I really think that Marxism is correct? He started thinking more deeply about it. So he was thinking <coughs> simultaneously about Marxism, Freudism, Adlerism, uh, and um, Einstein's relativity. He was thinking about these things. And going to, he was auditing lectures at the university and finding out all about these. He was quite prodigious at mathematics, so he could follow the arguments about relativity theory. Um, and he made a, a discovery which was to be the cornerstone of his thinking for the rest of his life. Uh, and that was this, that there was something different about the Einsteinians that marked them off from the Marxists, the Freudians, and the Adlerians. And it was this, if you talk to a Marxist or a Freudian or an Adlerian, they tell you what the system of beliefs is, and they, in order to convince you that the, that the system of beliefs is true, they shower you with all kinds of confirmations. Just pick up the newspaper and you'll see that Marxism is true. Uh, just pay attention to people's dreams and you'll see that Freudianism is true or Adlerianism. Um, and so he noticed that Marxism, Freudianism and Adlerism were very much like astrology, not like astronomy. And they're like astrology in this sense that they're looking for confirming instances, for things that can be explained by the theory. And every time they find something that can be explained by the theory, they think, well, that proves it. The theory must be true. Now, when you talk to Einsteinians in 1919, you had a very different picture. What the Einsteinians said was this. Our theory predicts something different to Newton's theory. Uh, and if you actually go out and make the observations, you'll find that our theory is correct and Newton's theory is false. Uh, nobody's done this yet, and it's actually quite difficult to do, but when it's done, um, you'll find out that the Einstein's theory of relativity is correct. Uh, so. <clears throat> And they, they would add, well, if we don't find this, then we, we must have been wrong. And Newton was right after all. So, <clears throat> while these other belief systems were very much concerned with finding confirming instances, confirmations, what the Einsteinians were doing was they were looking for refutation. They were saying, this is the way to refute a the theory. So this became the basic, basic idea that Popper had that there were a lot of discussions going on at this time about the difference between science and non-science. And what Popper said was this. Science is characterized by empirical testing. What does that mean? It means making observations. Uh, and the scientist doesn't set out to prove the theory true. The scientist sets out to prove the theory false by finding something happening which the theory says cannot happen. Uh, now, if the theory survives this, if it's not proven false, then we can accept the theory for the time being. We haven't proved it's true, but we've failed to prove it false. And this is, this is the basis of uh, Popper's whole philosophy. Um, now, the traditional view at that time was that uh, science proceeds by induction. Uh, induction means that you make a lot of observations and you draw conclusions from those observations. Uh, and what Popper decided was that induction is impossible. There can be no induction. This had actually been... Um, been put forward by David Hume. David Hume uh, in uh, the uh, early 18th century, when he was 18 years old, wrote 
what is undoubtedly the greatest work of philosophy ever written in the English language, the Treatise of Human Nature. And among the many things that uh, David Hume said in this book, <coughs> but, um, we observe something happening repeatedly, and then we, we reach the conclusion that that's always going to happen. For example, um, we see the sun rise every day, uh, so we think the sun is going to rise tomorrow. But logically, we cannot make any such inference. Uh, because no matter, and there, there are many sort of examples that are used to illustrate this principle. Um, the, the, the stock example that uh, people are always using is all swans are white. Um, <clears throat> no matter how many white swans you find, you can observe a million white swans. <coughs> doesn't show that all swans are white. Uh, in fact, Hume went further. Uh, he said it doesn't even make it more probable that all swans are white. If there's an infinite number of possible sightings of swans, you can see a million swans are all white. It doesn't uh, show that all swans are white. Now, of course, this particular example has a neat punchline because uh, in Australia they did find black swans. Um, uh, and uh, there were no black swans in Europe, but there were black swans, plenty of black swans in Australia. So that refuted uh, uh, that uh, claim. Now, induction used to be used to be described as going from the particular to the general. Um, you know, in logic, you can you can easily go by what's called a syllogism from the general to the particular. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. You've got the general all men are mortal, and from that you can infer that Socrates, since he's a man, is also mortal, or is mortal. Uh, but can you go from the particular to the general? Can you go from Socrates is mortal, Plato is mortal, Anaximander is mortal, Caesar is mortal? Can you go from that to all men are mortal? No, you cannot logically do that. You may have other grounds for thinking that that's the right conclusion, but you cannot logically derive it that way. So, um, what David Hume was committed to what's called empiricism. Empiricism is the philosophical theory that you get information about, you get knowledge about the world uh, from looking, from using your senses, accumulating information about the world. That's the source of your information, and that's the, um, the most reliable um, kind of evidence. So David Hume was, was an empiricist, but he was also somebody who destroyed empiricism because he um, became aware that all the conclusions that we suppose that we derive, or people used to suppose that we derive from observing the world, they actually require us to put something else in, some general principle uh, that we do not get from observing the world. Now, we can... We can um, we can observe that the sun rises every day, uh, but we can't observe that the sun will always rise. Uh, to go from the sun rises every, every day so far to the sun will rise tomorrow requires something additional. It requires a piece of reasoning, and that reasoning is not deductive. It's a different kind of reasoning. And that's why people say, uh, people who teach what is the non-Popperian standard view will say there is deductive logic and there is inductive logic. Well, what Popper was saying in the early 20th century is there is no inductive logic. Hume was right. Now, <clears throat> Hume, Hume reacted to this discovery of his, which is that you can't make sense of the world purely by observation. You have to put something else in. And that something else cannot be rationally justified. Uh, Hume reacted to that by saying, well, it's unreasonable, but we accept it um, because we can't do anything else. So Hume sort of pointed the way towards the rejection of reason. Um, <clears throat> Immanuel Kant uh, did something different. He argued that uh, since we do make these conclusions, then all of our judgments about the world involve something that we have added as well as something that comes in through the senses. Now, 
Popper has a different view from both Hume and Kant. Um, because what Popper is saying is this. Uh, we can, in fact, put something into the world uh, to try to make sense of it. But we can find it doesn't work. So you see, there's a little bit of empiricism. The observation can show that we're on the wrong track. But that's all the observation can show in Popper's view. It can't show that our theory is correct. So <clears throat> Popper's, uh, Popper's view is that we always start with a hypothesis. We always start with a conjecture. We always start with a guess. Before we observe, we have a theory that we're testing by our observation. Um, so Popper's view of science is we start with a guess, we try to test the guess. And we do that by working out the consequences of the guess, which might be quite a complicated procedure. And the, the consequences may not be obvious. It isn't immediately obvious from the fact that <clears throat> the velocity of light is constant, that uh, if you observe the perihelion of Mercury, there will be a slight deflection. It's not immediate. That takes a lot of working out, but it is a consequence. Um, and so the consequence may be very remote, for, but it's still, you can work it out by deduction from the theory. Um, and then you test it, you try to refute it. So this is, uh, this is Popper's view. And if you can't refu refute the theory, you stick with it. Now, <clears throat> what, what are the consequences of, of this? Uh, this has momentous consequences, uh, in, in Popper's view and in my view. Um, one, of the, one of the consequences of, is this. No scientific theory will ever be absolutely certain. Um, and Popper's reasoning here is no theory in the history of science was ever better corroborated than Newton's. It was amazing. Newton's theory, the way it struck people in the 18th century uh, and the 19th century too, uh, was just astounding how accurate it was, how useful it was, how perfectly it worked out in so many cases. Um, and yet, according to Einstein, Newton's theory is false. And uh, if Einstein is correct, then we have to reject Newton's theory. So, <clears throat> The old idea that predated Popper is that as you accumulate information, your theories get more and more certain. But Popper says, no, your theories are always uncertain. They're never going, your theories are never, ever going to become absolutely established. They're always going to become, they're always going to be tentative and provisional, and at any moment, you could observe something that shows that they're false. Um, now, there are some interesting little bits about this. One of them is that even if Einstein's theory turns out to be false, Popper's conclusion is still true. Uh, because the very fact that there could be a theory like Einstein's, which actually is contrary to Newton's, uh, but preserves Newton, Newton's theory as a, a good approximation uh, it, for, for certain purposes. The very fact that that's thinkable means that Newton's theory is not necessarily final. So when, you know, when Popper was developing these ideas, it's still possible that people were going to find that Einstein was all wrong and we, that Newton was absolutely correct. A lot of people strongly suspected this. Uh, but th this doesn't make any difference, really, because Einstein had posed something that was a possibility. We could consider it. Um, another thing that, uh, that is interesting about this is that Einstein's theory may not be true, but it may still be a better theory than Newton's. Now, Einstein never believed his theory. He always thought that it could be improved upon and that eventually we might hit upon a better theory, a unified field theory. Um, and um, the same, by the way, is true of Newton. Newton never believed his theory because he thought that action at a distance was absurd. Um, and, but he said, well, that's the theory. It works. Um, so both Einstein and Newton didn't believe their own theories. 
But they both thought they had good theories, and they were right. Uh, and Einstein's theory was a good theory, even though Einstein didn't believe in it. So in other words, it's possible to make the judgment, we have a theory here which is better than that theory, even though we don't think it's true. So <clears throat> this is um, one of the interesting aspects of Popper's development. Now, at the time when Popper was having these ideas, there was a group of people in Vienna called the Vienna Circle. And they were <clears throat> what is popularly known as logical positivists. Uh, among philosophers, they're more commonly known as logical empiricists. But logical positivists became marketed as a popular term for, for these uh, philosophers. And they were trying to do a lot of the things that Popper was trying to do. And one of the things they were trying to do was to say that if a statement is scientific, then it is meaningful. If a statement is unscientific, then it's meaningless. And uh, a statement is shown to be scientific it is, if it is verifiable, if it can be proved by observation. Now, Popper thought this was all wrong. And Popper became sort of the, op the official opposition of the logical positivists. And Popper said, well, no matter what you do with a the theory, you're never going to prove it's correct. So verifiability. Um, is uh, a wild goose chase. It's never going to be uh, done. Um, but Popper also said that things that are not scientific can be meaningful. In other words, there can be, there can be statements about the world which are not scientifically testable, but are still meaningful. Um, <coughs> a simple example would be determinism. Uh, Determinism is the philosophical theory that everything that happens had to happen. So the state of the universe right now uh, is the only outcome that could have taken place given the state of the universe a second or two earlier. Right? That's determinism. So everything that happens is bound to happen because there's an unbroken causal chain of necessity. Um, <clears throat> So, is determinism true or is it false? Now, the logical positivist would say it's a bogus question, it's a pseudo question, it's meaningless, it's gibberish, because there is no way to test it. And you can easily see that there is no way to test it, uh, because no matter how many regularities you find in looking at the world, um, it's still possible that there may be something that happens purely randomly that you haven't noticed, right? Uh, and if you find something that seems random, it seems as though it's not uh, due to causal necessity. Now, quantum physics has taught us that all kinds of things are happening all the time that are not necessitated by what came first. Well, you can adopt the theory that's due to our ignorance. We just don't know what the causal necessity is. Uh, it just looks random, but really, if we knew more, we'd know what the real cause was. So, and there are people who argue like that. So, determinism is irrefutable. There is, no, there is never going to be an experimental test. Is determinism true or is it false? Uh, but Popper says, no, but it's not a scientific question. It's a metaphysical question. But it's meaningful, and we can discuss it. And in fact, Popper has written quite a lot, hundreds of pages, arguing that determinism is false and that indeterminism is true. But he says it's not a scientific question. It's a metaphysical question, but that doesn't mean it's meaningless. It doesn't mean we can't discuss it. So, <clears throat> there is another thing about metaphysics, and that is that science actually needs metaphysics, according to Popper. In other words, science can never stand entirely on its own. There are certain general conceptions of the world which are unprovable, untestable, uh, which one needs in order to practice science. Now, the, the, let me just try to bring out some of the peculiar flavor of uh, Popper's views. Um, Popper is arguing that theories always come before observation. The, the standard inductivist idea is you accumulate a lot of observations, and then you draw inferences from those observations, and you build a picture of the world. Whereas Popper says, no. You can't observe without a theory. You don't know what to look for. You don't know what to notice. 
you don't know what to fix your attention on. So theory begins before observation. Um, and uh, um, in 1990, a book came out uh, by Alison Gottney uh, called The Scientist in the Crib, and it's about how little babies behave like scientists. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, and it shows how babies a few weeks old are forming hypotheses about the world and acting on them. Uh, and then, this, when they're disappointed, moving on to a different hypothesis. Uh, and as far as I know, Alison Gottnick was not trying to prove, prove her puppy was correct or anything like that. But this is what follows from a puppy. This is what you would expect from a Popperian point of view. You know, um, how many people here have heard the ex expression tabula rasa? Uh, <clears throat> nearly everybody, yeah. Uh, so I, I don't mean the episode of Buffy, uh, where everybody's minds are like blank and they don't know who they are. Uh, I mean uh, the idea that you're a blank slate at birth uh, and you just receive impressions. And then because presumably you have uh, <clears throat> some kind of um, reasoning power that is, exists within the uh, pores of the, of the blank slate, uh, you draw conclusions. Uh, well, Popper says this is entirely wrong. Um, <clears throat> when I was four years old, I remember asking a grown-up the following question. Is Jesus God's wife? Um, and um, the reason I asked that question was because I'd seen various pictures of Jesus. Uh, and it was obvious to me that Jesus was a woman because he wasn't wearing pants, he was wearing a dress and wearing long robes. Um, <clears throat> now it's true he had a beard, but that didn't mean anything to me because I didn't know any men who had beards, all women for that matter. Um, but <clears throat> I assumed that, uh, I didn't see a picture of God, so I assumed that he, had, he wore trousers. Um, so <clears throat> since God and Jesus seemed to be pretty close, um, this was a, a natural question for me to ask, uh, given my knowledge at the time. Um, and um, <clears throat> I was, uh, the person I asked this sort of laughed and said no. Um, <clears throat> but they're both very important people. <laughs> um, uh, so children are always trying to make sense of the world. Um, <clears throat> now, I've, been in, I've had four children and been involved watching them grow up. And um, at least two of those four children, I observed this. Uh, when they were at the crawling stage, uh, we had a carpet which had um, a floral pattern, and the floral pattern was like a bunch of flowers and foliage in certain areas of the carpet. So it's, it's like a, a two-dimensional pattern on the carpet, but it's got a sort of illusion, three-dimensionality about it. And I observed at least two of my children trying to grab this, this thing that was obviously there, and being disappointed because the carpet was just flat. Uh, so. They had this theory that the world is full of three-dimensional physical objects which can be grabbed. And anything that looks like a three-dimensional physical object is a three-dimensional physical object. Um, uh, but then they had to learn that that theory was a bit too simple. Uh, and it, had to, it was refuted by uh, observation. Um, and uh, <clears throat> they had to arrive at a, a, a more complete theory. Now, if we grew up in a world with a lot of, um, what do you call them? I um, can't remember the word now. The, those things that look like solid objects, but they're not really there. Uh, uh, no, I'm thinking of the ones that are done artificially. Holograms. Holograms, that's right. Holograms. Uh, if we grew up in a world where we, there was a lot of holograms, we'd have to adjust our theories a lot more radically than my kids did uh, to uh, understand that there are certain things that look totally solid, but they're not really there in, in terms of being uh, touchable. So... <clears throat> These are some of the consequences of Popper's view. Now, um, there are various misunderstandings of Popper's, Popper's ideas that are very prevalent, and you constantly come, in, come across them. People don't pay attention, and they, and they get Popper wrong. And I'll just mention a few things. Let, let me just say this. Um, suppose you have a theory, and then you work out a prediction from the theory. Then you'd make the observation and you find that the observation contradicts the theory. Now, you can do various things at that point. <coughs> you can accept the observation and abandon the theory. You can say the theory's been refuted by the observation. 
um, you could say that since I happen to believe that the theory is true, somehow the observation must be wrong. And there are various ways, of course, that observations can be wrong. Um, you can make subtle modifications in the theory so that it actually permits that observation. Uh, so you can change the theory slightly and say, well, the theory is ju just the same, really. Uh, we've just adapted it slightly so that it permits that observation. Um, <clears throat> or you can say, well, there's a problem here. Our life's full of problems that we can't resolve, so we'll just accept. We've got the theory, we've got this uh, observation that seems to contradict it. We'll go on believing both, but it's an anomaly that's out there. Now, those are all different possible responses. Now, which one of them is Popper's response? And most people will say, uh, read a bit of Popper, they'll say, well, it's, uh, you have to abandon the theory because um, the observation refutes it. But what Popper would say is they're all possible. All those, all those reactions are perfectly reasonable. It's the, it's the logic of conjecture and refutation which stays the same. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, logic deductive logic is used in debate. Um, so you can look at arguments and see whether they're valid or invalid, see whether they're sound or unsound, uh, but that doesn't mean that if you go to a logician and say, what are the best arguments for Hillary to use in the TV debate with Donald Trump, that the logician is going to give you a very good answer. There's a lot more to debating than having good arguments. Uh, and there's a lot more to science than the logic of science. So. Um, Popper's theory of the logic of science is not a recipe for doing science. It's not saying, do this and you'll do good science. Uh, that's a pretty complicated skill. Uh, and um, Popper's logic of science doesn't actually give you all the answers, or many of the answers for that matter. Um, <clears throat> now, there is, there is something I should add, though. Uh, if people m make observations which keep on contradicting the theory, and they never abandon the theory. There is a point where you're liable to ask, now, could you please explain what would lead you to abandon the theory? That's always a reasonable question if you're doing science. Um, what is it that would lead you to abandon the theory? Another, uh, another aspect of, of Popper's ideas which is worth remarking on is that they're Darwinian. They involve a struggle for survival, the struggle for, for survival among ideas. Uh, theories compete with each other, um, and some theories survive, they survive being killed by reputation. Uh, so there's a very a strongly Darwinian element here, and in fact Popper argues that, you know, lower forms of life, um, if they make a mistake, they die, uh, and uh, so that's how Darwinism works. But human beings can stand back from that, and they can let their theories die. They can say, look, we've got two theories here. Which one of them dies? And what you do that by trying to refute both theories, and the one that you succeed in refuting is the one that dies. So um, this is Popper's uh, Darwinian approach to um, the, the, the development of ideas. Um, now, I want to take an example that Popper gives uh, and pursue it a bit because I think that a lot of people have drawn false conclusions from this. Uh, Popper argued that Freudianism, psychoanalysis, is not a science. And uh, it's not a science because its main doctrines are not open to empirical refutation. In other words, if you believe in Freud uh, and psychoanalysis, you do not say, if we observe such and such happening, uh, we will have to abandon the theory. And you have to remember that when Popper was writing, most of the time that Popper was writing, from the, from the beginning of psychoanalysis, rough, roughly uh, in 1900 with the interpretation of dreams, um, up until the 1940s or even the 1950s, psychoanalysis was a big operation that was uh, had an... Uh, thousands of practitioners who all believed roughly the same thing. Um, they all believed certain things about dreams, they all believed certain things about childhood fantasies, and so on. 
Um, so it claimed to be a science, and uh, you know its its, its adherents said we, we are being scientific. And Popper said, no, it's not, a, it's not a science. And the reason it's not a science, he said, is because there are no falsifiable <coughs> claims there that can be tested by observation. Um, in, in around about 1984, there was a guy called Adolf Grunbaum who produced a book called The Foundations of Psychoanalysis. And uh, it's a book that is quite critical of Freud, but it's also critical of Popper. And he argues that Popper was thoroughly mistaken. And I think that Grimbaum, Grimbaum's book is hopeless. I think it really is a terrible book. Uh, he gets Freud wrong and he gets Popper wrong, again and again. So I'd just like to make a couple of observations about how, Pop, in my view, Popper's claim that Freudianism is not scientific is correct. What Popper did, he has, he has a a long discussion of this in one of his books called Realism in the Age of Science, where he shows, what, he takes the claim that Freud made that all dreams are wish fulfillments. Um, and there are certain problems with this claim, because let's say you have a dream that is, uh, you, uh, is like a nightmare or is just fills you with anxiety. Uh, in what sense is that dream uh, a wish fulfillment? Um, and that, Freud played around with different um, answers to this argument, this objection. One of them was that the patient has the wish to refute the psychoanalyst. So he comes up with this dream that is a refutation of psychoanalysis. That's one of, that's one of Freud's arguments, believe it or not. Um, and, um, you know, Freud wrote a quite a number of books, but two of them, and only two of them, went through many different editions, were updating and responding to objections and changing the arguments slightly. And they were the interpretation of dreams and uh, the psychopathology of everyday life. And the, so the interpretation of dreams, you can see how Freud is always in the different editions wriggling around, trying to answer this, the objections. Um, and, uh, and what Popper does in this treatment of, of Freud is he shows that that Freud is being very evasive, and that ultimately, basically, the fact is, no imaginable dream could possibly refute Freud's um, statement, claim, or that all dreams are wishful dreams. Uh, so therefore, it's not scientific, because there is no possible refutation by observation. Um, another, another example that I would make, uh, this is not Popper himself, is the Oedipus complex. Freud held that all human beings have an Oedipus complex. By the way, he thought that women had an Oedipus complex as well as men. Um, uh, but that when they got to the age of four, women discovered they'd been castrated because they didn't have a penis, and therefore they switched. Uh, but before that, they wanted to make love with their um, mothers and kill their fathers just like boys. Uh, then they switched. But so Freud argues that all human beings have an Oedipus complex, or an, have gone through an Oedipal phase of development, shall we say. Um, and um, <clears throat> the late Sidney Hook, um, a well-known American philosopher and, and sort of public intellectual, uh, he made a habit of over 40 years, at least, of his life. Every time he met a psychoanalyst, he would say, what would convince you that a particular human being never had an Oedipus complex. And uh, he never got a sensible answer. And sometimes he did this at public conferences, where he was uh, having controversies with psychoanalysts. Uh, sometimes he, was, he would deal it one-on-one -on -one when he met, met somebody at a cocktail party, but he, would never get a, he never got a sensible answer. In fact, sometimes they'd become very angry and argue that uh, um, he was a screwed up person for asking such a question. So, <laughs> Um, this would be another example of psychoanalysis, Freudianism, uh, being unscientific. Uh, so, um, Grumbaum's book, I think, is uh, seriously mistaken in, in various ways. And one of the things that I think it doesn't quite get right is this. When Popper says this system of thought is not scientific because it doesn't admit of any refutation, of any possible falsification. This is a question 
of how the people in that discipline behave and what the, the way they argue and the way they think. In other words, you can make a statement like every human being had an Oedipus complex. Um, and you can treat that scientifically. You can decide to treat that scientifically. You can decide to treat that uh, as a, a, a falsifiable claim. Or you can decide not to. Um, now, I'm a Cancerian. I was born under the sign of Cancer. Um, and uh, I've sometimes uh, come across uh, astrologers who've told me that um, being born under the sign of cancer means that uh, you have high artistic sensitivity, shall we say. Um, well, you could make that into a scientific proposition. You could actually um, find, find a test of uh, artistic sensitivity. You could uh, uh, interview a few thousand people at random, um, and you could find out whether by doing a special double blind so that you don't uh, deceive yourself, you could find out whether the Cancerians are better than the average uh, at this test of artistic sensitivity. So, um, there's nothing about astrology in, in the sense that it deals with the influence of heavenly bodies on human personalities that is necessarily unscientific. You can make anything scientific in an instant. Or you can make anything unscientific by refusing to um, uh, accept a possible refutation. So <clears throat> those are some of the points I would make about uh, Freud and, and psychoanalysis. Now, um, <clears throat> Popper had other ideas apart from his, um, apart from his uh, general theory of uh, conjecture and refutation. And I'm just going to mention um, a couple of them. Uh, <clears throat> When I say good and bad in Karl Popper, I generally think that his, his view of science and conjecture and refutation is correct, but I think some of his other ideas are wrong. Um, he had a very peculiar view of the mind-body problem. What is the relationship between the body and the mind? Um, and um, Popper's view is he put, it's called the three worlds view. Um, so Popper argued that there are three worlds. What he called them world one, world two, and world three. Actually, he originally called them the first world, the second world, the third world, but that became embarrassing because the third world uh, um, become, uh, acquired another meaning. Uh, uh, so it, that became distracting. Um, <clears throat> It's even worse in German because one of the natural ways to describe this is that it's the Dritte Reich, the third realm, and that has another, also a distracting, um, um, a distracting association that we don't want to get into. Uh, but so, so, um, so Popper had this idea: world one, world two, and world three. World one is the world of physical objects, the world that physics and chemistry look at. Um, world two is the world of subjective mental states like thoughts, feelings, uh, dreams, uh, imaginings, and so on. Um, and world three is the world of theories. Um, and Popper argued that these are three different worlds. Um, now, <coughs> I found actually that <coughs> many people find it difficult to see what, what the uh, idea of world three is, so I'm going to give you an example. If you're a chess player, you know that um, if one side has a king and nothing else, and the other side has a king, a bishop, and a knight, it's possible from any starting position to force checkmate. But from the worst possible starting position for the side, the superior side, uh, it takes a long time. It takes over 40 minutes. Um, now, that fact about chess was discovered centuries after the rules of chess had settled down. So in other words, the people who developed the rules of chess um, in northern India uh, and, and Persia 
uh, they didn't, uh, they didn't, uh, and then it developed later, and it developed in Europe in a somewhat different way. Uh, but the people who developed the laws of chess didn't know that fact. That fact had to be discovered. And it was discovered centuries after the relevant laws had been settled. So the question is, what kind of a discovery is that? It's certainly not a discovery about the thoughts, the subjective thoughts of people, because nobody knew before it was discovered that this was the case. Uh, and it's certainly not, a, uh, it's, so it's not about World II. Um, and it's certainly not uh, a discovery about physical objects. It's not a, a discovery about pieces of wood on a board. Uh, in fact, you can play chess without uh, pieces of wood on a board. I've played chess with people without a board or pieces. You just play it in your mind. Um, so that could have been the way chess developed as a mental game that didn't have a board and pieces. And this would still be true with, with the actual laws of chess. Um, so what, what, kind of a, what kind of a discovery is it? It's a very real discovery. It's a discovery about reality. It's not something bogus. Uh, it's a discovery about the world of theory. So this is why Popper argues that World 3 is separate from World 1 and World 2. Um, and he argues that the world, the world, world 2, the world of thoughts, is not reducible to World 1, the world of physical objects. Uh, and that it interacts with the world of physical objects. Now, this is, this is a theory that I used to believe in when I started reading Popper. I thought this is pretty convincing. I've gradually come to the view that this is a, a wrong theory because all these worlds are actually belong to physics. Uh, that there is nothing except physics. Uh, that's my view currently. Now, it doesn't mean that there are not such things as thoughts and feelings and mental states. And it doesn't mean that there are not such things as the law, uh, the discovery that you can checkmate with a bishop in 1940 moves. Um, <clears throat> what it means is they're all about the world of physics. Uh, these, are, these are all uh, things about the material world. So I won't argue for that at length because I've been going for quite some time. Uh, but um, that's my view. I, I no longer accept uh, Popper's uh, view that uh, was called interactionism, that the mind and the body interact. I think that the mind is an aspect of bodily behavior. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, Popper also had some views about free will and determinism that's based upon his interactionist view of the mind and the body. Um, <clears throat> he thinks that the mind is something other than material, uh, and he thinks that this is the key to, um, to solving the mind-body problem. Uh, now, Popper believes that indeterminism is correct. There is no determinism. There, there, there is ir irreducible randomness in the world. Um, <clears throat> that, th that certain things are irreducibly probabilistic. There is nothing beyond the probability as in quantum physics. Um, <clears throat> And I agree with that. I think that's correct. Uh, but uh, Popper has the famous assertion, which is actually the title of one of his papers, uh, indeterminism is not enough. In other words, it's not enough to give you real human freedom, uh, free will in the, uh, in the fullest sense. And I think that's wrong. I think that indeterminism is enough. Uh, because what we require from a theory of human freedom is, first of all, that human beings make choices, and no one disputes that, even if determinism is true, human beings do make choices. Um, secondly, that the choices they make were not the inevitable result of the previous state of affairs. And that is true just because of, of indeterminism, I think. So I, that's, again, somewhere where I, I disagree with Popper. <clears throat> now. <clears throat> Um, I will say a little bit about Popper's political writings. I personally don't think very highly of Popper's political writings. I never have done. I first read something by Popper, actually, when I was a Marxist um, in the early 1960s. Somebody said, hey, you should, you're a Marxist, you should read this. It refutes Marx. And I read The Poverty of Historicism, which is one of his two books about, <coughs> uh, about Marx, about Marxism, totalitarianism, uh, that whole cluster of ideas. Um, and uh, I was very disappointed because 
the, that book attack things that I didn't believe in anyway. And in fact, I, I thought, well, this is pointless, you know. Uh, much later, I realized that in that book and in some of his political writings, Popper was attacking something that I didn't know about then, uh, which is basically the whole Karl Mannheim sociology of knowledge uh, idea. And I later caught up with that, and that didn't impress me, so I wasn't really looking for a refutation of that. But anyway, um, I've always been disappointed with Popper on politics. He wrote a giant book in two volumes uh, that was published in 1945 called The Open Society of Its Enemies. It's been very highly regarded, uh, and, it might, and it had a, a, quite a bit of influence. Um, and I think it's good in the sense that there are lots of details in the footnotes which are fascinating. Uh, but I think the main line of argument is not all that great. Um, <clears throat> uh, in, the 19, in, in the period of the Second World War, Popper was in New Zealand, so he was sort of out of the back of beyond. He, he got a job in New Zealand and he went out there. Uh, at the end of the war, he came to London and then he started to become a famous person. But, but he, so he wrote some of his stuff uh, when he was in New Zealand. And he wrote this book in, uh, in New Zealand. Um, and I'll try to give you a picture of what it's like. Um, one of the things was that in, in New Zealand, there's a large population of who were the natives of New Zealand before the Europeans got there, who were called Maoris. And they're, they're Polynesians, so they have the same basic sort of language and physical appearance as Hawaii, native Hawaiians. Um, and um, they're a tribal, traditional tribal society, or they were. And, and Popper thought, looking at them, that they were very much like the ancient Greeks had been before they had settled down and formed city-states. Uh, and he read Plato in that sort of light, that, um, that they had been a society like the Maoris, uh, and then they had developed city-states, they'd become literate, and they started to argue among themselves. Uh, so <clears throat> you get this transition from a tribal society where you don't really question anything, and there is no sort of discussion. Uh, do you think that myth about the gods is true? Oh, no, I don't. You know, that doesn't go on in, uh, in Maori society, apparently. Uh, or in Greek, early Greek society, before pre-literate Greek society. But it does go on in ancient Athens, as we know. Um, even though occasionally people were executed for coming up with the wrong answers, uh, it did go on. Um, so, <clears throat> so what Popper argues is that the original closed society was a tribal society. Then it evolves uh, into a more open society. And this is good. Uh, because uh, it develops the human mind, uh, and people have all sorts of interesting ideas, science can develop, people are critical, they reject things that are false and move on and prove their ideas. So open society is good, closed society is bad, but within this society in transition to an open society, there are people who find certain things distasteful about the, new, the way things are developing, so they have a hankering to go back to the closed society. So this, so this is the original idea of the closed society, is it's a tribal society. But then society keeps on developing. Um, and so Plato wants to go back to the tribal society on a higher level, uh, where the guardians ensure that only the right ideas are disseminated and that sort of thing. And so Popper is arguing that, no, uh, <clears throat> we've got to maintain the open society, and it should be a democracy and his argument for a democracy is that it's a way of replacing the government reasonably, uh, reasonably peacefully uh, and in the light of... It, we don't get a perfect government. So he says one of the things he's um, <clears throat> very much against is this idea of seeking for perfection in social institutions. What we want is to avoid the worst, uh, is basically the idea of the open society as enemies. So, um, so he comes up with a elaborate defense of democracy, uh, which is all based on the idea that the state should obey certain rules about not overreaching itself, not becoming utopian. So, um, time for questions? We're, no, we're getting close to it. I mean, it's about 7.45 and with, with things like that. This is an open society. Open okay. society. All right, I'll take the first question. Let him conclude. Uh, Give okay, him go ahead and conclude. 
conclude. We have a number of people with questions. Yes, I'm, yeah. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. All right. Tim was making All some right. so I went. Don Stinker, Stinker. Don Ramsey. Uh, 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 Don Ramsey. Lucky Don Ramsey. Don Okay, David. Um, I, I was reading your article here that that, that is, is over here on the table that, that you published after after Karl Popper's death, and it yeah. says you 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 say here politically Popper followed the trajectory of most social democrats. Pragmatic and surprised acceptance that in one piecemeal area after another the malodorous market. In uh, fact, wait, can I can I finish, please, bro? All right, uh, then. The malodorous so, market, in fact, produces better results uh, than proceed. government intervention. And what yes, I wanted to what ask you is use the word. I'm, I'm curious about the word better. I mean, better how? Better in what way? Um, well, first of all, let me say that was an obituary I wrote. Uh, no, no, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, in, uh, yeah. When it, whenever it was that he died, 1994 or whatever. Uh, and um, I hadn't actually, I haven't read it all the way through for many years. So, you, so you're going to have to really re read that one well, set. Okay, let me just, the, the point, okay, what you wrote is that, is that, um, is that he, you know, he had this pragmatic and surprised acceptance that in one, um, of the fact that in one, you state as a fact that in one piecemeal, in one piecemeal area after another, the, the the market would in fact produce better results than government intervention. And it's interesting you state that as a fact. And to me, the whole thing hinges on the word better. I mean, how do you define how do you define better? I mean, uh, for example, would a result that that makes the rich richer? But but leaves everybody else worse off. Is that would you consider that a better result? Or no, what, I, what I, exactly would, I would consider it a better result if it made the rich a lot richer and the poor not so poor. Oh, okay. You mean so? Okay. Um, it, so so in other words, so by better you mean because that that really gets to the question of what what you would consider improvement, and I mean so. Uh, so you're saying that uh, basically, uh, by the, leaving the poor not so poor, I mean, do, are you arguing that basically a society that, do you believe in a society that, that rewards some people and, and not others, or do you believe in the whole Benthamite concept of the greatest good for the greatest number? I mean, um, what's, your, what's your criterion for good results? We could, I could go into this, however. Um, I'm, what I'm saying there is not really dependent upon any very precise uh -huh. answer to that question. In other words, if people have um, fuller bellies and uh, less insecurity and less crime uh, and more of the good things of life, that's better. Uh -huh. uh, so, so I would say, I would say, if you look at um, uh, the division between East and West Germany in 1945 and then look at, uh, c come back and look at East and West Germany, say, in 1970, I would say, say people in West Germany were doing a lot better than people in East Germany. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, and um, I would say, you know, that, um, I mean, research into subjective well-being, which is fairly recent compared with the, the things we've been talking about, in other words, how happy people are, shows that, um, what are called market democracies. Uh -huh. uh, in other words, societies which have a predominantly free market with predominantly private ownership of capital goods, uh, people are happier than they are in other kinds of societies. So, I mean, people, first of all, rich people are happier than poor people. Happiness goes up with income, uh, although it goes up very slowly after a certain threshold is reached. Um, uh, and the happiest people in the world, according to the latest research, are people in countries like um, Denmark, uh, the Netherlands, um, these these um, kind of affluent capitalist countries. Oh, okay. So, so I, I mean, I mean, I would say people in Denmark are a lot better off than people in um, um, uh, Tanzania. Okay. 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 So, so I mean, we could go into some of these philosophical questions about what really counts in terms of um, 
better off and so on. But it, I'm making a very rough and ready okay. judgment there. You know. David Singer and then oh. uh, Tim Bolger. How, how popular is Harper today? I heard him a number of times, but I never delved into his... Uh, in fact, I never read any of his writing. Is, he, is his influence very great now? Uh, what? what? I, I, you know, I didn't quite get what he was getting at. He was an anti-Marxist. I got that. What, what did he... Well, uh, first of all, I, I mean, it, maybe it didn't come across very clearly from what, <coughs> what I was saying, but... Um, most of Popper's working life is concerned with philosophy of science. Uh, there was this period in his life, like the 30s and 40s, where a, a brief burst of activity, where he wrote about political philosophy. But then he sort of mostly gave that up. Occasionally he would come back and comment on something, but basically um, uh, he says actually in his um, autobiography, his autobiography is very readable, it's called Unended Quest. Um, and um, he says in his autobiography that his wife said to him, you're not a political philosopher, you're a philosopher of science. So get back to that. And so he thought, yeah, that's right. And he got back to it. Uh, so, uh, so that's one thing about Popper. But, oh, but although, he hated the truth. Sorry. Although probably the two, the two books on political philosophy, The Open Society of its Enemies and The Poverty of Historicism, probably have sold more copies. Um, so that's one part of the Popper picture. Um, <coughs> now, I would say... Popper has something in common with a number of people, let me say. Popper has something in common with uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, um, Sigmund Freud, um, uh, I'm trying to think of some other examples. Um, what, he has in, what he has in common with certain thinkers is that he's more, he, he's, he has a following among intellectuals, but his following is much greater outside his particular discipline. In other words, most people in philosophy of science are not Popperians uh, uh, today, for various reasons. Um, although they're very much affected by people who owe something to Popper. So, you know, Popper, they would say Popper is a giant figure in the history of philosophy of science, but they think he's wrong for various reasons. Um, so, I mean, so, he, so he's, he's one of these sort of intellectual figures who appeals to a broad public, a readership, broad readership. Uh, he's very readable. I mean, um, the sum of his stuff is very technical and has logical symbolism, but most of it doesn't. And, 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 where, and most of it's very readable. You know, you... you, uh, you, you he writes, he, he, one of his beliefs is, so that he has stated many times, is that in inter, any kind of intellectual has a responsibility always to be as clear as possible uh, and never to obscure things or dress things up in uh, uh, mystifying language. Hey, Jim. You know, I, this is probably the first time I've heard about Karl Popper. At, at this lecture at the College of Complexes. And, you know, I, I hear from you that he made some recent, you know, works and contributed to, to science. Why should I know about him? And why should I really care? Well, um, first of all, you might be interested in science right. and what makes science science. Uh, secondly, you might be interested in some of these basic philosophical questions like, where does knowledge come from? Um, uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, so, <clears throat> but thirdly, he has had an influence. I mean, um, uh, an influ there, are, there are many people in the world who, uh, practical politicians and others who have been influenced by him. Actually, one of the things about Popper is that scientists usually like him a lot. Einstein liked Popper. Uh, Richard Feynman liked Popper. Uh, and, and they all said things that were quite Popperian. Um, so um, so he's, he's, he's one of the influential figures in modern thought. I mean, I, I was looking on the web where you were talking, and it appears also that 
Ted Cruz likes Karl Popper. Uh -huh. uh, well, that's entirely possible. I don't know if he knows much about uh, Popper, but um, uh, I mean, look, the people people come to Popper for all kinds of different reasons, okay. um, and um, there may be sort of right wing people who think, well, oh, Popper attacked communism in the 1940s, um, and so that's good, yeah. and maybe that had something to do with why. Um, Popper was knighted when uh, Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, that's possible. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. Yes. Um, what happened to Popper during the war? He was in Vienna. The Nazis came in. What happened to him? Did he flee to England or what? what uh, yeah, happened? Well, basically, he, he looked for a job anywhere. And, uh, um, uh, he, he took a job in New Zealand. Uh, I couldn't hear the question. Somebody repeat. The question was about the time of Anschluss, which was, what, 38? 30, yeah, 37 uh, or 38? 38. Right. I mean, he'd left, well, he'd left it, Austria before. It was about before. to happen. Right. So, so he had to get out, you know, because of his ancestry. Oh, and yes, I mean, he would have chosen to get out anyway. <laughs> Bloody nightmare coming. But, um, uh, yeah. All right. Um, Let's see. Uh, yes, Bill Webb. Uh, are you not familiar with the Austrian School of Economics? Has there been any interaction between the Austrian School and Karl Popper? As, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am very familiar with the, the Austrian School of Economics. Now, when people say the Austrian School of Economics today, they usually mean the Misesians. Um, and generally speaking, Popper and the Misesians don't get along uh, because um, one of the things about Mi Ludwig von Mises is that he is a methodological dualist. He thinks that the social sciences are very different from the natural sciences. And one of the things about Popper is that he insists that the method of all science is very similar. So he, he, Popper would not accept the, the, the notion that there is a peculiar method for the social sciences. So, um, uh, the Misesian idea that you develop economic theory from self-evident axioms based upon introspection into the nature of human action is not something that Popper would accept for a moment. Uh, you know, Popper is uh, very much a methodological monist in the sciences. So, they, so, <clears throat> I mean, there are a lot of, uh, I know a lot of people who are involved in Misesian economics who call themselves Austrians. Uh, and I agree with Popper. I think that the, the Misesians are quite wrong about the methodology of economics. Um, but um, they, they might, may, many of them might find they have something politically in common, you know, that they're not, they're anti-socialists, for example. Um, but Popper was a socialist when he wrote um, The Open Society and its Enemies, but he gradually evolved becoming less and less of a socialist and eventually a kind of classical liberal, um, although still believing in things, some state welfare and things like that. Um, so, um, yeah, they, they, I would say they're basically incompatible. Popper and Mises are incompatible. Now, before Mises, there was a, a big history of the Austrian School of Economics. Uh, Eugen von Berlinberg, Karl Menger, all those people who didn't believe in the, the Misesian methodology and I think that Popper would be more, uh, more in harmony with them. I, but I also think that, um, that the Chicago School, Mil Milton Friedman and the Chicago School, would find Popper more congenial than the Austrian School. Because of, his, because of his emphasis on empirical testing. Because the Chicago School was always big on empirical testing. All right. Um, Bob Lichtenberg. Could you summarize uh, Popper's uh, arguments for metaphysics, you know, a higher than a materialistic level, and then why, why do you disagree with his arguments about more than materialism? Uh, well, uh, there, there is the point that I agree with him on, which is that um, uh, just because a statement is not scientific doesn't mean it's meaningless. Um, and there are many statements that are that are um, that cannot be tested empirically, that are still highly meaningful. Um, so I mean, I think it's perfectly reasonable to de debate whether there's a god, right? For example, 
which is a, a metaphysical question because there is no observational test, um, or whether determinism is correct. Again, there is no observational test. Um, and there are many sort of metaphysical issues like that, uh, which, does the past exist, right? There's a metaphysical question. Um, uh, and I, I think those are quite reasonable things to discuss, although they're not scientific questions. Um, now, there are, on the mind-body problem, uh, I suppose that there wasn't sort of... Um, I didn't have a Damascus Road conversion. I just gradually be became convinced that um, I just gradually became convinced that um, we don't need anything more than the material world to explain thoughts and other subjective entities. You know, I, I, I mean, I, what I do, what I do think is that. Um, that conscious entities like thoughts do exist. So I don't agree at all with um, behaviorists or with people like Daniel Dennett who basically don't think that thoughts exist, uh, don't think that states of consciousness exist. Um, but that is common ground between me and Popper and lots of other people, right? So, uh, but what I, do, what I don't think is that thoughts, or the, the what goes on in the mind is, uh, what, what, when something goes on in the mind, I think that it's an aspect of a material entity, the brain, right? That's what I think. And, I, and, and it seems to me that, that um, there are all kinds of things that tend to push you in that, into that, to that conclusion. One of them being that um, it's difficult to see how this if you get into a non-material, sort of uh, intellectual, mental sort of realm, how it's going to affect the material world. I mean, you, you've, got, you've got this is one of the age-old problems. If you do think the mind is a different substance to the body, how do they interact? And how do they interact so reliably? Like, I don't suddenly start having your thoughts, uh, and you start having mine, right? <laughs> there, is, there is some intimate connection between the brain and, and, the, and, and the mental events. So. Um, I, I, I just don't I just don't see any need to accept this other non-material realm. Hmm. I have a question myself. Go ahead. Oh, let's see, uh, Charlie, you have a question. Yes, uh, uh, sir. Regarding the problem of induction, when I I don't have any problem with it. When I leave here later on, and have to cross the street, I think I can do so successfully and that's no problem in my method. And I've done it any number of times. I don't see if there's a problem. It's quite utilitarian and workable. Oh, so where's so the problem? So what is your, what is, do you have an argument that that well, requires it induction? Well, it the claims of solve the problem, but I don't perceive what the problem is. Oh, the problem is that um, there is no way to move deductively soundly from a limited number of instances to a general law. That's the problem. That's Hume's problem. Okay. David Hume's problem. That it's all that's always an illegitimate logical leap. Just because my knowledge is an absolute, it's invalid. This has nothing to do with whether knowledge is absolute. It's just logically impermissible to move from a limited number of instances to a claim about all instances. In, in, in other words, Charlie could get hit by a car if he didn't see it. I don't know what Charlie crossing the street has to do with this. I'm trying to make, trying to see the connection, but it, Char my Charlie's rules. thoughts are too deep for me. My ah. universal rules of pro street crossing. What's that? Is my you know? universal rule of street crossing. Okay. Oh, look, I think, I think, I think that Charlie's right that he is able to cross the street. Yeah. He does get across the street. That's I don't dispute that he does. Uh, 
uh, until he gets hit by a cab. Well, all right. All right. Well, that's saying it's problematic. That's the problem. Hey, look, the, the problem the problem is this: um, uh, if you if you if you observe a million white swans, you're not entitled logically to conclude that all swans are white. Now, scientific laws like e equals m c squared or any of Newton's laws, whether they're true or false, the scientific laws uh, are always universal statements about everything in a certain category. You know, they, it, uh, a scientific law never says e equals m c squared except when it doesn't, right? It's always a universal claim, um, and uh, all scientific laws are like that. So, uh, you know, in, in the vicinity of the Earth, the um, things accelerate with a, a uniform acceler acceleration. If you're going to have for wind resistance, right? Uh, that's that's a, a law that, say, Galileo or if somebody I take that. This um, and the, thing, the thing is, Does what entitles draw? you to say that that holds true in all times and places uh, from a few thousand observations? And the answer is nothing. If I take this cup and let go, it drops. Now, is there going to be an instant where it's going to go up? Uh, well, there's no gravity, but that's... Uh, okay. I, I've uh, heard, it, uh, heard that the uh, exception that he had, that Karl Popper had to uh, Marx or to socialists uh, generally, was that you, he felt that socialists were more interested in equality than in freedom. Uh, that's not the picture I've been getting from uh, Marxist humanists uh, of Karl Marx as a uh, Freudian, uh, uh, excuse me, again. And uh, I, I do think that, that Hegel was definitely very much interested in freedom. Keep it. So, though it may have been freedom of the mind, uh, well, I think that that's an accurate reading of proper or? Well, I mean, there's two things here, and I'm not sure that they're all that closely connected. I mean, first of all, there is the fact that Popper made a statement late in his life. He said, um, I used to believe in socialism. But I gradually realized, something like this, he said, I've gradually come to realize that um, if you try to attain equality, uh, you lose freedom, and furthermore, you don't get equality. Um, so in other words, he, he, in other words, like most people, Popper got more and more right-wing as he got older. That's, that, that's, a, that's not an absolute law. I'm not putting that forward as Thanks, a sign uh, But it's a generalization, that one's yours. Uh, often true. Um, and, um, uh, and so that was the way he explained why he um, had been a socialist in his youth. And what, that was how he interpreted it. He was drawn to socialism partly because of the ideal of equality. Now, the thing about Hegel is something else again. Now, <clears throat> this book, The Open Society and Its Enemies, volume one is all about Plato. Volume two is partly about Hegel and partly about Marx. A little bit of volume one is about Aristotle, actually, but, mainly, but very little. Um, so a lot of the discussion that there has been in the scholarly uh, press about the Open Society and Its Enemies is about whether Popper got these thinkers right, you know, whether he, whether his account of Plato is right, um, or whether his account of Hegel is right, or whether his account of Marx is right. So there's a lot of discussion. Um, that, 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 you know, thousands and thousands of uh, papers and books have been written on these issues. Um, you know, um, uh, Popper argued that Plato um, falsified Socrates, that Socrates believed in uh, freedom and equality, uh, and um, Plato was uh, this sort of totalitarian author authoritarian uh, figure who misrepresented Socrates. Now Hegel, um, there's, I would say there's been less controversy about what Popper said about Hegel, but I think it is true that I've read people who interpret 
Hegel in a very libertarian way. Uh, I think um, Kaufman did, you know, uh, and um, Paul Kaufman. And um, uh, so I think there are probably a lot of, the, I'm not acquainted with all the discussion there, but um, I mean, I mean if, if somebody says that the Prussian state, it, the Prussian monarchy is the, is the uh, final stage of the evolution of humankind, uh, but then you do have to do a bit of digging to find them to being in favor of freedom, but maybe it can be done. Okay, I got one last question for you. Talk about Karl Popper's relationship to Mr. Jinx. Mr. Jinx was the guy, was the cartoon character who said, "I'll get you Mises two pieces." I hate Mises. I hate Mises. I hate Mises two pieces. <laughs> oh, I see. Yes. Actually, Popper didn't pay much attention to uh, to um, Ludwig von Mises. Um, he probably paid more attention to his brother, Richard von Mises, who was a big probability theorist, actually. Really? Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, in, in respectable academia, mm -hmm. uh, Richard von Mises is a much bigger name than Ludwig von Mises. Richard von Mises? Yeah. Because, because his, he is, he sort of, he states one particular view of probability theory. Uh, as a classic state war. Okay. Um, his brother, uh, most economists don't have much time for Ludwig von Mises. It was, it was meant as a silly question, but a quite reasonable answer. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Let's go into rebuttals, Brock. Uh, Peter, I take it with um, He said that theory precedes uh, observation. Yes. Uh, that seems sort of counterintuitive to me. Yes. How was he able to demonstrate proof that? Well, first of all, he argues that <laughs> You don't know what to observe unless you have a theory, right? Um, and um, he argues that you know that a human baby or a fetus is programmed with certain patterns that they're trying to impose on the world through, in their, in, in the, even before they're conscious. Uh, so he, 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 this is true even of unconscious. Uh, animals, if you think there are some animals that are unconscious, okay. uh, like slugs and snails, but they are trying to impose a particular pattern on the world, uh, and the world resists, and so there's a, there's a kind of dialectic between what they're trying to impose upon the world and what the world lets them impose in terms of their understanding of the world. So um, it's, it, it is counterintuitive, because we've got used to the idea that you just look around uh, and you... Um, you, you make certain observations and you draw conclusions from those observations, but Popper argues that's the result uh, of uh, an elaborate series of, uh, system of development in, in the fetus and in the newborn baby. Uh, and uh, there, in fact, uh, if you read, there is a book he wrote. Uh, he wrote uh, jointly with a brain surgeon, Sir John Eccles, Popper and Eccles, it's called The Self and Its Brain. Um, where they discuss this at length, the, the, the various phases that a newborn and fetus goes through um, uh, in its gaining sort of some kind of understanding of the world, uh, with always with, even before it's conscious, this entity has expectations, unconscious expectations about the world. It, they're, it's not, they're not, a newborn baby isn't sitting there passively I'll, I'll wait for these observations to come, uh, and then we'll see what's what. Uh, the newborn baby has uh, is, has strong opinions. Uh, is the newborn baby is bigoted in its opinions about what the way the world and the universe should be, uh, and uh, it has strong expectations. Uh, and these get modified because of experience. But you have to have. I mean, uh, you know, a rock is uh, is tabula rasa. You know. And that's why it doesn't ever do anything, it doesn't think. Uh, you, can, you cannot start from just observations, it makes no sense. I mean, one way to think about this is, suppose you were going to design a robot to learn things about the world and go around and do things. Uh, how would you do this? Well, you would have to program into that robot's brain uh, certain expectations about the world. You'd have to program in certain biases in what it was looking for and what it was reacting to. 
you, you can't program a robot that just is totally open uh, uh, because it doesn't have, that has an empty mind. Uh, you can't do that uh, because it won't be able to observe anything. Okay. Uh, an induction, uh, uh, making uh, uh, observation based on limited observations. Um, now, isn't that really considered a collection of data which people actually use to do research, collecting data? Well, you have to distinguish between taking a sample of a limited number of uh, entities and um, making observations and then making a universal law. Those are, those are different operations. I mean, um, you know, there's, there is sampling theory and there is the Gallup Gallup poll and so on, um, but um, that's a, that's perfectly legitimate and it's entirely deductive as well. It's not, there's no induction required, uh, but actually um, coming up with a universal law, universal generalization based on a limited number of instances, that would be uh, induction. And see, Popper argues not only that we shouldn't use induction, but we don't. But he argues that when we think we do, we're fooling ourselves. But what we're really doing is guessing, and then sticking to our guess, just like Charlie. Okay, All last right. question. Uh, Russell Johnson, you have oh, the last question. Uh, did he have any uh, dealings with uh, Austrian uh, economist Friedrich Hayek? Yes, they were very close. Uh, they were they were very Hayek and Popper. There's a. Um, it was Hayek who got. Popper a job in at the London School of Economics uh, and enabled him to leave the backwater of New Zealand and come to London. Um, so that was Hayek. Uh, and Hayek and Popper constantly wrote to each other, had arguments, uh, developed their views in uh, reacting to each other, right? Um, you know, the road to serfdom by Hayek came out the year before um, the Open Society and its enemies. Ooh. And of course, they, they dis both discussed these works among themselves uh, intensely. Now, a lot of their discussion, they actually discussed in person at the LSE, uh, so we don't know. But, the, but they also wrote, and, and there's a lot of record of them. And there's been a lot of scholarly work recently by different people. Uh, Jeremy Shearmuir is one who's written stuff. Uh, Mark Naturno is another, about the exact relation between Popper and Hayek and how it changed, because Hayek was much more of a free market person initially than, Hayek, than Popper was. <coughs> um, and Popper was somewhat scandalized by Hayek being so free market. But then Popper himself became more free market over okay. time. We're going to have to get into rebuttals. It's now about 8.17, right. so we got... Thank you, Tim. Uh, yes. All right. Um, Let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Be ready to uh, come forward with your rebuttals, or at least uh, your remarks to the rest well, of us. Uh, we can can I'd suggest we make a three-minute time limit. Three minutes. Oh well, we uh, the, we'll the, go the for. The suggestion is three minutes. We can go for if there's not a lot. But you have 20 minutes of remarks. I'm sorry, I'm just you're going to have to edit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, ready? Get okay, up there, yeah, Don, yeah. and start. Okay. All right, all right. This is a really interesting uh, lecture. It's always uh, every lecture I've ever attended by David Ramsey Steele. I learned something. And I think that's what the College of Complexes is all about, you know? It's a place for learning, education. Um, I basically, you know, um, you know, I asked you a question about, you know, what you would consider a better result. Um, and I basically agree with your criteria, that I think that, um, uh, that that's something that, that, you know, that leads to more happiness. And the people are generally, it's not all the time, but people generally are happier when they're more prosperous. And so a more prosperous society, a society where people in general are just more prosperous, is, is going to be a, you know, is going to be a better result than one that isn't. And I would also agree with, with what you said that that if you, you take a country, if you take a country like Germany and you split it in half, 
and then you, you make one part of it communist, East Germany, and then you, the other part isn't communist. The, the, the West Germany, West Germany was democrat, was it was a had, had a democratic government, and the West Germany was way West Germany was a much nicer place to live in higher standard of living, and the people were free in ways that the people in West Germany were free in ways that people in East Germany were not. For example, they were free to criticize the government without having to worry about getting thrown in, in jail or killed. Um, the same thing if you take another country like Korea, you split it in half, and, and, and you got North Korea up here, South Korea down there, and, and well, South Korea now has a much higher standard of living than North Korea, uh, and um, both became industrialized, but, but South Koreans are better off, and, um, and they're, they're more freer, too. And actually, I'd even argue the same is true if you take, let's say, if you compare Taiwan and mainland China, with, with mainland China being the communist country and Taiwan being the non-communist country. But that doesn't mean, I don't believe that that resulted from, um, from, 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 no government intervention. Let's take, for example, because if you compare, you brought in the example of Tanzania. I mean, Tanzania is a country where people are, for the most part, live pretty much, the, most people live the way they always have lived. Um, uh, you know, and for, for thousands of years. And, and so, you get, you, they, people are illiterate, they, you, you get sick, you die, you know, you, 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 live, you eat whatever you can grow, or cattle, you know, and whatever you can grow on your own on your own land, and uh, when whenever there's, if you compare, you know, the things like having a high standard of living. One of the things that that's resulted from is from education, and education. We have universal education, universal literacy in the developed countries, but it's not a result of market forces. It came about because of the the government and its public schools. Um, likewise. Uh, when you have, when, when, when having a high, having a, a long life expectancy and a low infant mortality rate, um, well, that, you know, when you have, when you, when you have some kind of, when you have the government provides health care to people in some way, you have a higher standard of living. And so in those ways, in things like health care and education and welfare, that actually produces a more prosperous society as a result of government intervention. So, so I... So I'm, I'm not in favor of a dictatorship like East Germany, but I do think that some government intervention does produce better results of the subtype that David Ramsey Steele is talking about. Now they have all of those things in West Germany, so it wasn't it wasn't like they said, okay, we're just going to abolish the government for everything except the courts and the military, you know. Um, okay. And in, in, they didn't do that in West Germany. There's a lot of government involved, but it's it, they have a much higher standard of living. And I see that Tim is cutting it. Tim is drawing his finger across his throat, which I guess is a warning of what will happen to me if I go over You're time. So well, at this yeah. point, I'll let it go to the next speaker. What's next? Next. All right, come on. All right. Our next no. speaker. Is there any other speaker? Yeah. Speakers? No. Yeah, there. There. You see, Don, you. you you scared everybody away, Don. Yeah. Hang on. Uh, well, by making that, that about what I said about you, Tim, uh, I was joking. Uh, but All I can say is I wish David would have given me the fact that he was such a close associate of Friedrich Hayek. I probably would have listened a lot more yeah. intimately. And I'll be looking forward to uh, watching this on video more. Because I'm very familiar with the role to serve them by Hayek, and then of course his brother is something I, I didn't know either. So I'd like to say thanks no, for not Hayek's brother. Oh, Mises' brother. Mises' his brother, yeah. And but that's all I can say. David, I want to say thank you again. It was an enlightening lecture. Now come on, we got we got more people who gotta come up here. Oh. Let, 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 let's go, Bill. No one's next. Okay, Bill. All right. Uh, one question I didn't quite get to is uh, we didn't get to it in the last one, Bill. Do the Freudians have a uh, pleasure principle? 
and the reality principle. And uh, I read into a psychological dictionary some years ago that the pleasure principle is in the head. It's so all about whirling subconscious desires. And what I see, in my estimation, a political discourse even here at the college of complexes is more based on more on the pleasure principle than the reality principle. Yeah. Now, I've, I've been very much a devotee of the Austrian School of Economics for about 45 years. I'm also kind of a devotee of the last paragraph of Keynes' general theory, which he says that we can't, you know, people can't learn new theories after about age 30 or 40. And I can't see that here, too. Uh, I, don't know how, I don't have much contact with the younger generation, but I'd like to have them. I mean, I think my hockey stars. I was about 23 or 24 when I first ran into it. I was in Harry Brown's How You Can Profit from Becoming Devaluation, which is an excellent first course in economics, and I think it's an even more excellent umpteenth course in economics. But uh, I, th I think uh, you know, I've, uh, several times I've cited well, the, this book, uh, Leaky and Lewin, uh, People of the Lake, Mankind and Its Origins, which says that the human social and psychological attitudes formed in hunter-gatherer bands of about uh, 15 or so. And these bands could... Uh, you know, it is very possible uh, under that kind of limited circumstance to have a socialist power, indeed, what's uh, proper and what isn't. And there's no problem knowing it. It's just a kind of a glorified extended family. Knowing what uh, the meanest objection to a socialist power is that it takes the market to process all this information. And I remember seeing a book about 50 years ago said that the market is like a, a, a computer and garbage in, garbage out. And that's, you know, you guys keep hollering about all the garbage, but you never really look into the, uh, what, what it is originally. And I uh, think Tom Bain said something about uh, when we trace things to their origins, we understand them a lot better. Okay. But I'll see you guys come up with some of your uh, superficial impressions of the market. I mean, mean by superficial, you don't really examine them. Uh, like Hopper would uh, advocate. Okay, your time's up, Bill. All right. Well, and next, you, please. Bill. Next. All right. I'll get up there. I'll get up there. I'll get up there myself. I'm Jonathan Barton. None of your observations are accurate. <laughs> well, tell us why, Charlie. Okay. You all have a problem with right. conducting. You ready? Yeah. Maybe you can correct. All right. Who's who's next? Yeah. We've all got problems. So Jonathan is going to edit my, my, my remarks. Okay, ready? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, my, uh, my understanding of Karl Marx is that he is very much interested in human freedom. He, he sees humanity as enslaved by many of the uh, processes of its existence, of its day-to-day -day existence. Uh, and 
the conditions differ with the the age and circumstances of uh, of, of the uh, times. Uh, so, in the age of capitalism, uh, he wants to uh, support the liberation that capitalism has given uh, from a feudalist and an, uh, a, uh, <laughs> authoritarian society. Uh, at the same time, he sees uh, tendencies uh, to enslavement in the capitalism. Uh, of, uh, and he's working out a, a theory of the social revolution that uh, he sees as possible. Uh, and, uh, and that's not, not an easy thing to do, and uh, particularly when uh, most of the world has an interest in, uh, in conforming to the world. Uh, that's what education is all about, uh, understanding and conforming to your world. Uh, a capitalist-dominated society is made for the capitalist mode of production and distribution, and uh, it, it is not beneficial to uh, the whole of society, or at least it's uh, very injurious uh, to the uh, welfare of a great many people in society, uh, to the benefit of a very limited and, and under capitalism, a narrowing uh, class uh, in society. Uh, so uh, people are being squeezed out of their, uh, their what shall I call it, the, the middle of the uh, the bourgeoisie into the proletariat. And he sees the pro proletariat there as the, the class in society that is interested in fundamentally changing the relations of production, the social relations of production, so that, uh, so that the, Workers like like our waitress here, uh, Heather, uh, uh, will have a little more say as to her hours and uh, her conditions of work, and uh, uh, and perhaps the general operation of uh, the enterprise. She said, "You know, all those things work together." Okay, time, Brom. Uh, but make for a freer and more human uh, relationship in society uh, if you if you pursue them uh, and, and the uh, the equality that is time. needed for that of time is, however, making me speed on. Bye bye. All right, yeah, next, Jesus. please. Yeah. Oh, See no. you around. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, Bohemian socialist, uh, altruist poem once wrote, What keeps us going is not buying in to the ever-growing lists of lies and myths, like that we can't change at all now or that we don't have the will or the power to be. We know we do. We were born knowing. So uh, hearing your talk, it made me think of that poem. Uh, we know we do. We were born knowing. You have to have a theory before you ask the question. Uh, sparked my memory to mention that. What that directly has uh, to do with Karl Popper and his life's work, uh, I don't know. Uh, but what I thought about when you were talking about uh, his criticisms of Marxism and socialism, 
was that uh, nowadays people are really searching for such a thorough analysis that these words often, uh, they need new words to explain what they're attempting to explain. So a lot of times these ex explanations are very, very important and they don't have the important words to explain the definitions that can help us understand why they're important, if that makes any sense. Uh, you know, a lot of times when you talk to people and they're looking for something that might be called we the peopleism, or civilizationalism, or equalityism, or democracyism, or uh, something that is hard to unlock our capacity for because we have yet to find a universal vocabulary that provides that analysis in an articulate way that can be communicated in a short amount of time. So I'm very thankful that our speaker was here today because I never heard about Karl Popper and it's made me find more questions than answers and I think that's a good thing. So thank you for coming tonight. Next speaker. Surely we've got an open mic. Charlie, go, go ahead. Four minutes. I'll keep, I'll keep you. Bob Lichtenberg. I guess Carl Popper is a pretty good philosopher. He, uh, he's not a biggie, he's not a major one, but he's got some good ideas. Um, I like the idea of falsifiability in science, just the idea. I can't plumb the whole depths of the philosophy of science. He did um, start a lively debate about the philosophy of science, which is still going on today, and he is a major contributor. And I think falsifiability is a good idea because, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, if the theory can't be falsified, then you can't prove it. And a great example is Freudianism. A lot of Freudians said that, um, uh, you know, you um, love your mother and you want to kill your father, and you deny it, and um, they'll say, well, it's subconscious and you can't know it, you know. But then some subconscious, you know, can't be refuted by something conscious. So, so the Freudians are, uh, you know, straight down on that basis. And that's a good test of any scientific theory. It's not the whole story, though. That's a big part. Um, I think uh, Popper was uh, right to reject materialism um, and stick with it most of his life against the logical positivist in Vienna. He was one of the few to do so. I'm not sure why he did, because I don't know him that well. I don't know his arguments. Um, uh, I myself have six arguments for uh, metaphysics or intangibles. I just um, give one. I can't even remember all six anyway, and six would take way too long. But the main one is consciousness, which he was very interested in. Um, and as a rationalist, Popper maintained that consciousness cannot be reduced to a brain state. And I agree. Um, how can a brain produce consciousness? A brain is a thing. Consciousness is an awareness or a state of mind. So things don't have state of mind. Things are just matter, you know. Yeah, uh, and no matter how we evolve chemically, they're still physical. And to be aware of them is a totally different level of existence, I would argue. You know, it's an immaterial, intangible level. <clears throat> um, okay, I guess my time's on the stuff. Um, uh, like I said, I think Popper is a pretty good philosopher, um, making major achievements in the 20th century uh, in ways I could agree with most of them. And he had a mostly good influence, too. I, I'm not knowledgeable about his social or political okay. part about the open philosophy. Maybe you could hear a little bit more in the summary on that. And the, the final rebuttal, I mean. All right. But it's good talk. We're getting close on time, so I'd like to... Charlie, please keep it brief. Yeah. Keep it brief, Charlie. Yeah, real brief. Yeah. Yeah. Time. No, it's late uh, 36. That's no, it's... Uh, plenty of time. 8.39. All right, let's thank our speaker. Very good. Thank you. I'll be brief. I think the problem is...
many years ago I learned the difference at the college, as a matter of fact, between the inductive and the deductive method, arriving at truth. And guys like Tim and other asserted theologians are stifled with this um, uh, deductive process. And I um, really don't understand what the discovery of proper is. It's because I always thought inherently in the inducted method was a revisionist element. Meaning, uh, you, how else do you come up without, without making observations? You, 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 and then you engage in, on the basis of tests and measurements in which you apply some mathematical application. This is a method for arriving at the truth as opposed to the deductive method in which the, I guess simply through closing one eyes, engaging in rationalist thought, you arrive in an absolute truth for all eternity, which is not subject to change and in any circumstances whatsoever. So some guys go listen to a holy man and he tells them a whole bunch of these and they all nod their head, yes, 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 sir, that's correct. Now, understandably, in the inductive method, yes, there are difficulties. I was thinking there's hard sciences, uh, particularly subject matters such as astronomy, in which there are distances and barriers to arriving at truth. And sometimes you have maybe one observation uh, on which to rely on. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, each scientist, I think, asks himself or herself the question, how strong is the evidence? Now, I actually have been having some fun in looking into this and how strong is the evidence. I've been looking into whether or not there is a creature known as Bigfoot in the United States. But I've been witnessing how some people will accept the truth and others don't. Yeah, it's, 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 but some people are applying rigid standards to say that the truth that they arrived at is invalid. That's the essence of this as opposed, I'm, that's the beauty of the scientific method coming out of Bacon was that there inherently is a revision factor incorporated in it. It is not a problem. That's the beautiful feature of it, is that it is not eternal. Take it or leave it, folks, like in church, or get out, That's, or we kill you. If you don't believe us and accept what we tell you, we will kill you. That's what they do. Sure. Anyhow, thanks a lot, David. It's All right. The time David, you get the final Is that word. Is up for you? Okay. Three minutes, not bad, yeah, Charlie. Be sure to go to church tomorrow so they can spoon-fed you the truth. Here's I'll the truth. Sure. Here's yeah. the truth. I'll be at Springbrook. Not your you. head. Not your head. Do you believe or not? I believe I'll be at Springbrook Community yeah. Church tomorrow morning. Charlie, at uh, actually 11. But uh, hey. go ahead, David. Okay. Uh, well, as usual, I'll just pick up a few of the points. <laughs> Somebody took, some, some people said they were interested in pursuing further the Bob's ideas, so I would say that um, there are, if you go into um, any book, good bookstore and look at the philosophy department, you'll find stuff by Popper. Uh, his, um, his autobiography, Unended Quest, is very readable and uh, gives you a good idea, of an overview of his ideas. Um, there's a, uh, a collection called Popper Selections, just se selections from the key passages from his works, edited by David Miller, uh, which you, you can get in any good bookstore, and uh, that's worth reading. Um, the book I wrote about psychotherapy, Therapy Breakthrough, um, I wrote it with two psychotherapists. Um, in, in this book, I look at Popper's relation to Freud and so on, so there are some interesting material in there about, um, uh, about Popper and psychoanalysis. Um, <coughs> What's that? His relation to Wittgenstein. Oh, right, right. Uh, yeah. Well, that's, fa that's fairly famous, right. Um, so, I'll say a bit about Popper and Hayek. Um, Hayek, of course, was an economist by background. But Popper originally didn't know much about economics, so they, they both taught each other certain things. Um, and one of, the, one of the things about Hayek, where he was very indebted to Popper, was that 
he started to write about the way economic, economics should be a science. Um, and he was, when he first started doing this, he was very much under the influence of the old inductivist school. Uh, but what Popper taught him was that um, the way science works is not the way the inductivist said it was. So um, it was mu that was much more amenable to um, Hayek's view of what uh, economics should do uh, if economics was going to um, continue to be a science. Um, somebody said that Marx was interested in human freedom, and I agree with that. I think Marx was interested in human freedom, uh, but he made certain mistakes. Um, enslavement by capitalism, I don't see that you're enslaved by capitalism. Um, and it, what, that wasn't made very clear what that, what that amounted to. Um, in a capitalist society, people are able to earn a living. Um, they're able to save and uh, accumulate wealth in that way uh, if they choose to. Um, and um, I'm not, I'm not, uh, the fact that you have to go to work uh, if you weren't born with a uh, fortune uh, doesn't seem to me to be enslavement. It's just, that's just a reflection uh, of the general fact that there, there is scarcity in the world. And as capitalism develops, more and more people uh, do have uh, savings that uh, uh, are an alternative source of income from, being, from selling their labor services. So uh, none of that strikes me as at all in, uh, impressive. Um, again, Brom said that, uh, that capitalism is injurious to the welfare of many people, but he didn't give any examples, so I'm not quite clear what he meant about that. Um, now, uh, there was a statement that um, matter cannot think or cannot be conscious, so these must be different worlds. But I think that's just a dogma. Uh, it seems to me that um, uh, what we do know is that there's a very close connection between thinking and the state of the brain. Uh, we know if the brain is, is damaged in various ways, thought ceases, or we don't, maybe we don't know that. But it seems that it does. It seems that consciousness disappears unless a uh, certain minimum brain health is, is maintained. Uh, so uh, right there we have this close connection that prompts the thought that thinking is something that actually goes on in the brain. Yes. Uh, and um, it seems to me that it does, that thinking is something that goes on in the brain and nowhere else. We certainly don't have any evidence of uh, of uh, thinking happening in a disembodied state somewhere. Um, so um, I think that I've said enough, and so does Tim. He thinks I've said enough. So um, uh, we agree on that. Thank you very much. All right, what did you learn? Come again, we'll see you in the video. Yeah. 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 Y